maybe we should start answering some questions in here. I have two, six questions in here. There's another one. Okay, Jenny. Okay. So, the first question, it says, even though we work to know ourselves through meditation, what about losing oneself in a group or, or through dance? Dancing, that is, yeah, that is to say. Uh, losing yourself through music and in a group of people can also bring bliss. How is this bliss different or, uh, or the same? Is it different or the same? Well, <coughs> it says you're involved in extra-aerobic dance, you're involved in a dance, and you rob in some music and you lose yourself, um, you relax, you don't think of any worries, you have no anxiety when you're listening to the music, you have no worries, you have no anxieties, and there's absolutely no other consequences other than that. Um, um, and you say you lose yourself, I think what you mean by losing yourself is you got relaxed, you're not tense. Um, yeah, uh, you're free from all this mental uh, anxiety and depressions. That's great. That's good. How does it different from? Is it different from, from uh, the uh, the kind of joy in the meditation? It's different um, because you still have attachment, but not attachment. If you're attached to bad thing, of course, that's good. Not no good. You're attached to alcoholic drinking. You're attached to. Uh, to luxury perfume, for example. You're attached to luxury f food or, or dress or cars or material. Uh, there's no good. But sometimes um, you want to listen to music. You, you attach to music, but not frantically uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, at attach. If, you, if you're crazy about it, that could, a pop could, could be a problem too. Um, for example, if you listen to music, the kind of music that you like at home, your, your, your brother hates it, your sister hates it. And because you want to be carried away, you want to lose yourself, you want to relax, that's the way you relax. You don't care about others. You just get lo losing yourself. You really lose yourself. You, you lose your cooperation with others. You lose your care with others. You just think about yourself because you want to listen to the music and because you can achieve what you call bliss in that listening, if you start to be selfishly not caring for other people, is that right? It's not right either. So, attachment, if that kind of attachment is free from given, giving encumbrances or troubles to others, that's the first requirement. Do uh, you want to listen to music? That's not hurting any, anybody. However, some people get relaxed by watching certain movies or they feel the excitement having inside by watching certain movies. They are also not hurting other people, but they are hurting their nature. Uh, for example, they are, they are watching restricted movies and they find fun in doing it. And that's, that's not right because they are building up bad karma inside the nature. And uh, um, uh, if they keep on doing that, they would carry their conceptualization into action, and that's how they commit sexual misconduct. Now, if you, are, if, you, if, if, you, if you lose yourself in certain kind of music, you have to watch out what that music will lead you to. Some music will lead you to a ram that's not too pleasurable. Some music will lead you to imagination that is not too pleasurable. You could be imagining about something when you're listening to that kind of music. And some, some people like to, to listen to soft music, some boisterous music. And some people like, like to listen to nostalgia, nostalgic music. And some people who were born in the 60s and or, or, or 50s, they, in the 50s, they like to listen to, for example, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, Nat King Cole or, or Frank Sinatra or, uh, or you name it. Johnny Mathis, oh, all those old nostalgic singers, and they were listening to it, they were thinking of the old past. And then that, that they, they attached to the past because of the music. A little bit of attachment to the past 
uh, remembrances of the past, especially of your forefathers' past good deeds to you, or remembrances of your mom, of your dad, of your, of your grandfathers who have done good deeds to you, that kind of remembrance are uh, good. That is good past reminiscence. However, if you're, if, if, if you're listening to certain music that instigate your, your remembrances of bad deeds, of child abuse, that's no good. So you can see, listening to music has so many facets you have to listen, you have to, you have to care about. Let's just say, when I listen to music, I lose myself, and therefore, that's the same as meditation bliss. No, you are just stereotyping. You are, you are, you're simplifying something that is so complicated. Because listening to music, you're attaching to something material. You're not freeing yourself from material. And who knows what that material will lead you to. The material may lead you to good things, to bad things, to indifferent things. That's, that's the unknown. It will lead you to the unknown. So if you ask me, is it good to listen to music or to be involved in exorbic dancing? Some people like to, they come for meditation on Saturday, on Sunday they go dancing. And depends on what kind of dances. Uh, if you're independently performing the exercise, it could be okay. But if, the, if that kind of dances involve body touch, that may instigate something else. Um, so, and also when you're in the extrapic class, and there's men and women, men looking at good-looking girls and girls looking at good-looking boys and all these things, all this mixture of feelings and all that, what would that lead to? Relationship? What that relationship will end up in? I don't know. A myriad of, 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 of things can happen. Um, so it's, it has the good and bad sides to it. However, if you can control yourself in the extrapic exercise, if you can control yourself in music, if you really care about others when you're listening to the music, why not? And if you really want to compare it to the meditation bliss, to justify yourself in listening to the music you want, I think you, you, you are egoistic on your view. <laughs> my brothers and my sister always blame me for listening to, to, uh, to, uh, to rock and roll, and I, I, I will, you know, even the, the venerable said it's okay. No, I didn't say it's okay. You really have to consider others' interest. And I can go on and on to answer this question. There's no need. Well, use your own judgment. Care for others. Um, if music can lead you to a realm of relaxation, that's good. Especially some, especially some music, they call it the meditation music, where they have soft, Nature, music about nature, uh, music that, that, that encourages you to, to nurture nature, to love nature, or music that encourages you to, uh, to, to be a better person. There's, that's kind of music. A music that, that can conjure up your, your patriotic feelings. Um, that kind of music is good. But don't get carried away. That's enough for this question, I guess. Already 10 minutes. Next question. We spend our lives acquiring knowledge. It seems ironic about knowledge uh, would, would cause us trouble. We have to let it go in order to achieve nirvana? Yeah, another question. That is good. Another good question. We acquire knowledge give you an example. We acquired knowledge of science and uh, E equal to mc squared, relativity. And because of this scientific knowledge, we know that we can create atomic bombs. And because of the creation of atomic bombs, we have this Hiroshima bombing, which kill millions of people. So the knowledge that you acquire has the pro and cons in it, if you use the, the knowledge intellect, int intelligently, then it could be serving mankind. 
if you're using the knowledge unintelligently or harmfully, you're hurting mankind. You created an atomic bomb to be dropped into Hiroshima. I remember many, many years ago, that was when I was in my secondary school, and when I was in Hong Kong, we studied Chinese, we didn't study English. And I, I, I went to uh, Temple Street, there's, there's a street called Temple Street, and uh, on this, one of those stores, there's a few English books, and I pick up one book, and it says, The Bombing of Hiroshima. I don't know what Hiroshima, the bombing of Hiroshima. I pick up the book and I started to read this. It contains so much vocabulary that I don't understand. Uh, the first, when I turned to the first page, a second page, I, I couldn't continue. And two years later, I read it again and I understand more. And I got some information from there. The bombing of Hiroshima is not just killing on spot the millions of people, but it has far reaching effects into the future. The, nu the nuclear energy that stays behind, that ruins nature, that ruins uh, the species of mankind, is far-reaching. So the knowledge that you acquire could be good, could be bad. So I'm giving, so then you ask me the question, Venerable, how come you always give the example that is bad? I'll give you a good example, good knowledge. Good knowledge, you keep, you keep the good knowledge and you continue to promote the good knowledge. What is this good knowledge? Knowledge of Buddhism is an, another kind of knowledge. About Buddhism, of the Buddha's teaching, you know the Buddha's teaching, knowledge, you know it. And with the Buddha's teaching, you help mankind. You improve the welfare of people. But finally, the Buddha said, once you get ashore, get rid of the raft. When you, get, when you want to go to Victoria, you, you, you go Nanaimo Ferry, your, your destination is Victoria. When your ship reach Victoria, are you going to stay on the ship? You're going to leave it, get rid of it, get rid of the knowledge, and get onto the, to the realm of comprehensive knowledge. Get to the realm of, I don't know, extreme wisdom. Even the knowledge of Buddhism has to let go, not to say ordinary knowledge. Sometimes knowledge would help to sustain your egoistic view. <laughs> would, would only help to sustain your, your obstinacy. Have you seen any arguments in a debate? In a, in, 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 have you been in any debate? In a debate, there's, there, there's the, the pros and there's the, 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 the two teams. And they all stand for their own view. And sometimes none of the views are correct, but they still want to sustain it because they want to win. Look at political parties in the parliament. I'm in that party and I'm protecting party's interest. I know I have knowledge of my party. You have knowledge of your party. I protect my knowledge, you protect your knowledge. I protect my knowledge, I want to get into power. When I get into power, I promote my knowledge. My knowledge could be wrong. My knowledge about capital, capitalism, my knowledge about communism, my knowledge about socialism, my knowledge about anything in the world, I protect my knowledge at the expense of yours. Is that right? So, so I say knowledge you have to get rid of, even Buddhism you have to get it off finally, not to say knowledge. Not to say your knowledge of biology, your knowledge of physics, your knowledge of medicine, or oh, you name it. But if your knowledge is helping people, that's good knowledge. Your knowledge is ruining people, that's bad knowledge. Bad knowledge you really have to get rid of. But sometimes good and bad is relative. One good knowledge is bad, is, is good one to one society, it may be bad to another society. So they vary. They could be misused. So you have to apply judgment onto it. You have to apply wisdom onto the use of your knowledge. That's what we call prajna. Good use of knowledge is called prajna. Remember the prajna? Prajna is to how to use good knowledge. 
how to steer and gear your knowledge to the right path. That's, Buddhist, that's, that's the Buddhist teaching. So don't say that we don't want knowledge. Good knowledge is good. Good medical knowledge help a lot of patients. So why don't we keep that knowledge? But some people could misuse that knowledge. So we have, it's, it's a temporary knowledge that we have to be careful about. There's no one answer to this question. We, there's a Chinese saying, we can't use just one bamboo pole to sweep off every, everybody in the raft. You, it, it, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't apply one understanding to apply to everybody. Knowledge is good, knowledge is no good. All relative. Use your judgment, use your wisdom. That's why in the six Pajna parameters, we have what? We have uh, charity, morality, endurance, and diligence, and meditation. And the sixth is what? Wisdom. You need wisdom to guide your meditation knowledge. You need wisdom to guide your morality knowledge. You need wisdom to guide your charity knowledge. You need wisdom to guide your endurance knowledge. Prajna. Okay, that's all for that. <laughs> Next, it appears that a, a, a simpleton has the upper hand achieving nirvana since he's unable to think much or possess or, 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 or he is not, he's not pressing for worldly possessions. A simpleton. I remember I saw a movie, it's called A Bouquet for Charlie. Have you seen that? Many, many years ago, there was a, there was a movie, uh, oh, many, many years ago, in the, 50, in the 50 or 60s. It's about a, a man who, uh, who had a sickness, and he went to see a doctor, and the doctor said, and that man is an intelligent man. And, uh, and the doctor said, in three years, you're going to be a simpleton. You lose your intelligence. And uh, um, that's what it is. That's your sickness. And within these three years, he's trying to do the best. He's trying to render his, his, his best love to his wife, to his children, to the community, and all that. And, uh, and in the third year, he turned into a simpleton. Is it good to be turned into a simpleton? If you're a simpleton, how can you render your love, your responsibility, your love, your compassion to the society? your responsibility to fulfill your responsibility in the society. In a sim if you're a simpleton, there's many things you can't do. You prefer to be a simpleton just for the sake of, not just for the sake of having an upper hand on nirvana. To get nirvana, you cannot be a simpleton. If you're a simpleton, you cannot even, you cannot even apply your wisdom. So don't try to be a simpleton. A simpleton cannot think properly. So I guess you're just looking for argument. <laughs> you, you don't want to be a simpleton. A simpleton is no good. I don't think you'll be a simpleton when some food is presented to you. Which one do you pick? The best, the most delicious one. You won't be a simpleton. No one is a simpleton in here. So, a simpleton has an upper hand achieving nirvana. Well, why don't we say like this? If you are away from luxuries, if you don't attach to luxuries, you don't want attach to the com contemporary way of life, you want your life to be simple, and you want to be, you want to be economical to you, you are frugal, you live on frugality, even though you have the money, but you like the money to spend somewhere else to help others, wh whereas why are you are living, you are living, uh, leading a simple life, not a simpleton in terms of the brain? You don't want to be simple. You want to. You don't want to be a simpleton in terms of your own brain. You want to be a simpleton. In, in the, in the fulfillment of your life, in your luxuries, you want to simplify it. You don't need the best car. You don't need the high best house. You don't need all that. But you, you, you want, you want to contribute that to the society. You, you lead a simple life. 
Many multi-billionaires are like that. Nowadays, more and more. I won't say many, but some. They live a luxurious life and they find out that that's no good. I want to be simple. So they wind up living in the village and they, may, they, may, they donate all their money out. And they find more happy leading a simple life. I think that's what you should mean by sim simplicity. Simplicity is beauty. Luxury is not. Simplicity is beauty. So don't try to be a simpleton in terms of your brain. Try to be a simpleton in terms of enjoyment of luxuries. Simplify your life. You don't need the you don't need a you don't need a Rolls Royce. A Volkswagen will do. You don't need a, a six million dollar house, a man a, a mansion. A nice apartment nearby will do, close to the temple, so that you can come to the temple on Saturday to have meditation. So where some people here, they live very close to the, to, the, to the temple, that's a simple life. You can afford a mansion, but you don't want a mansion. You would prefer to donate $5 million to, uh, to, to some mission. Simplicity in terms of life, but not in terms of intelligence. That's it for this question. Next, if we are to rid our, ourselves of all desire, all the way to the point of no, no Dharma, then are we to rid ourselves of our desire to attain enlightenment nirvana as well? Are we to, no, uh, then are we to rid ourselves of our desire to attain? Of course you have to. We have, we, we must, we not, must not have desires. I put this desire in quotations. You need good desire. You need the desire to be the Buddha. You need desire to do good. You need the desire to fulfill all your responsibilities. It's just bad desire that you don't want. How do you define desire? Desire is something that you want, you want to achieve. If you don't have an objective, how can you do anything? A desire is where you would like to reach, to have. So you, you still need an objective. My objective is to, is to be able to, uh, to help others. My objective is to do voluntary work in, 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 in the hospitals. My, obje uh, my objective is to stay away from bad deeds and do good deeds. You need desire. If you don't have desire, you cannot be the Buddha. If you, don't desire, if you don't desire to be the Buddha, how can you be the Buddha? If you don't desire to be a good person, how can you be a good person? You've got to have that objective in mind, your mission. You have to have your mission in mind. I think you, you interpret desire in a, in, in a bad way. You think all desires are bad? No, some desires are good. You have a point to point out? No, I thought, I thought you have a point to say. Okay, some desires, some de it's only bad desires that you don't want. You need, you need a desire. A desire to be born into the pure land. If you don't desire to be in the, born in the pure land, how can you go to the pure land? You have to desire to go to... If you, if you, if you want to come to Canada, you have to desire to go to Canada. Then you come. You need the desire. And you need the desire to attain enlightenment. And you need to achieve it. It's a good desire. Next question. It was mentioned that there should be no judgment in the mind. Yet deciding whether an action is good or bad requires active judgment. What should be the guidelines for these judgments? It was mentioned that there should be no judgment in the mind. No, there should be judgment in the mind. Did I say no judgment? I said no discrimination in the mind. Your judgment, you have judgment, but that judgment, that judgment is being influenced by your background. That judgment is being influenced by your habitual thinking. If my background is, is, is in this way, I will judge in that way. If my background is this way, I will judge, that, that judge in this way. So my, my judgment very much depends on my education, my background, my family background, and in some cases, 
my ju the judgment that I have also is influenced by my past life karma. So you've got to watch your judgment. And if you don't have the right base for your judgment, you tend to do the wrong thing. So that's why when we're studying Buddhism, we need the three foundations of Buddhism. What is this? Precepts, meditation, and wisdom. Sometimes you don't know whether, whether we should do this or not. If, if your judgment is wrong, then you did the wrong thing. So you need to know what is this things that I should do and these things I shouldn't do. And the Buddha, in the process of his 49 years of teaching, he arrived at some precepts, something that you should watch out for in your living. He arrived at those things because different people have different judgment. How, how did the Buddha teach you what kind of judgment is right, what kind of judgment is wrong? Then the Buddha, gathering all the information within the 49 years, and he called it the, the canon of precepts, the Vinaya. And then how did he arrive at those judgments? By cases. Here is this monk who made that mistake. Okay, let's write it down. This monk, being influenced by this kind of circumstances, make this kind of mistake. So this is rule number one. When we have this kind of circumstances, we should not make this kinds of mistakes. If we have this mistake, we should have this repentance. Okay, case number two, this monk, because of that circumstances, that environments, make that kind of error, but we shouldn't make it, and let's put it down. So all, all the 49 years the Buddha has made for the big shoes, for the male monks, 350 precepts. And for the female, 348 precepts. And if you follow those precepts, you will make as close to a good judgment as you can. Because what is contained in these precepts? You must not kill, you must not lie, you must be, you must be courteous, you must, you must not uh, slander other people, you must not have a flattery language, you must not, have, you must not be cursing people. All these would bind you, you gear your way towards good judgment. And those are the set judgment. The established judgment. How about the unset? Or we can say these are the official judgment. There's also the unofficial judgment. What is this unofficial judgment? The unofficial judgment is the general concept of life. What is this general concept of life? You've got to have wisdom. You get to care for others. Not specific, specifically point by point, but the general concept. The general judgment, general concept to help you make a judgment, specific concept to help you make judgment. If you follow the Buddha's precepts, you will probably, because the Buddha's, when he make, within 49 years, when he make this kind of precepts, it's sort of comprehensive, generally cover many things. But since there are so many objects, so many circumstances, there's no way that you can, you can write millions of precepts out. They already have identified the most difficult ones. I mean, I mean the most obvious ones. So judgment, there should be no judgment. Yes, there must be judgment, but you've got to have the right judgment. How do you know what judgment you're right? You study the Buddhist Vinaya. You study the general sutras. That's how, why we're studying the commentaries, we're studying the sutras. We find out what's the good judgment. But then you say, how do we know the judgment of the Buddha is right? There's some people who like that. How do we know the judgment of the Buddha is right? We know the judgment, was, we know certain judgment is right or wrong. First, we look at from the contemporary world's perspective. Is it hurting others or not hurting others? Is it beneficial or unbeneficial? That's the first criteria. If your judgment is rendered hurting others, that's not the right judgment for sure. I don't think anybody here would argue hurting others is the right judgment.
Well, there's so many flexibilities, so many things to talk about in judgment. And I don't mean to, to say that my answer right now is it, is open end. It, it, it requires books to be written about this. It requires a lot of analysis. It requires a lot of wisdom to analyze this. Anyway, that's it for this. The sitting with bare feet facing towards the Buddha statues show disrespect. If you, in your mind, that you are sitting in front of the Buddha with a bare feet, you worry about being disrespect, why do you still do it? Because you think barefooted, barefoot, uh, is disrespectful, then you don't do it. On the other hand, if you think, well, in, in, in Thailand, in Burma, in some of the tropical countries, uh, when, when they meditate, they don't put on shoes or socks. They have the bare, they're barefoot. They, are, they, they don't put on socks. And uh, um, I don't find this is disrespectful. And I find that I, I, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I just want to be in line with, with the Theravada school. And that's not really disrespectful. But in Canada, I don't think anybody would go barefoot when you go outside. Maybe in the summer, yes, they do. But in, 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 in Southeast Asia, uh, the monks go bare, barefoot. And it wouldn't be disrespectful. But when they enter the house, they have a, a, they have a, a bucket of water to wash their feet. Uh, especially, especially put in, in front of the house, when they enter the house, when they enter into the temple, they wash their feet before they enter the temple. So there's a tradition. If your tradition is not, is not a tradition of always go barefoot, why do, you, why do you do that in front of the Buddha in here? Uh, if you have that feeling of disrespectfulness, then don't do it. If you don't have that feeling, then you can do it. There's no one answer to this. Um, yes? Disrespect is a state of mind, not a physical condition. Yeah, exactly, yes. Good point, it's a state of mind. It's not a physical, uh, uh, physical condition. Um, if, you, if, if your socks are extremely dirty, don't put them on. <laughs> you better be barefoot. You see, it depends on circumstances. Um, keep your feet dry. If you, if, if, if really, this is something that you really have to think about. If you enter in the temple, if you are barefoot, you may spread germs in your feet. Especially when we're in Hong Kong, we call it the Hong Kong feet. Then you spread all the germs around. But it, it, then you say, oh no, I don't want to put in my socks. That's good because you are not spreading the germs around. That's why we don't use carpet upstairs. We use marbles. But if, because if you use carpet, you, you take your shoes off and then you walk on the carpet, a lot of spreading of germs from your feet and some people's feet, they, 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 they smell worse than others, then you make the carpet smelly. Okay, that's it. Venerable, can the temple organize cooking lessons so that those interested can learn how to cook vegetarian dishes, temple style? That's a good suggestion, but for those who are interested in, uh, in, in cooking, then we'll get a Ming, uh, but then why don't you... Uh, uh, enlist them. Put, a, put your names on a, on a list of paper. If you have more than 10 people uh, who are interested, uh, then, then maybe uh, they organize a cooking class for you. But first of all, we need to have uh, people who are interested uh, because time has to be spent in preparing for it. And, and, and also there may be a cost involved because you have to buy material. You have to buy vegetables, uh, they, they, you have to buy utensils for cooking. It's not just talking about it. You need someone to organize it. This is a course. This is a course that needs an organizer. Can you organize it? Or can you be one of the, one of the, uh, the, uh, the organizers to help to, to make these things happen? If you do, then you, why don't you put in a piece of paper, you hand it to me and I hand it to, to, to Ming. Uh, if you have more good enough, good number of people, 
and you don't mind chipping in money to buy the raw materials for the cooking, it involves some money. You have to buy the vegetables, you know, but if you have a group of people, then everybody contribute a little bit, so it's not too expensive. So it all depends on how you organize. Okay, uh, a f a last question, but not least. A friend of mine who has been coming here for many years told me when he has to make an important decision, he always asks Buddha what to do by shaking the bamboo sticks in one of the hall here, and he always got the right answer. What is your opinion about this? Oh yeah, that's a, oh yeah, it, it happened. It happened uh, in many many cases like that. There was a uh, uh, there was a late there was a woman who was pregnant and uh, they had two girls and uh, the man uh, being a Chinese who wants the, the, uh, the hereditary trait to pass on from one generation to the other would like a boy because he already had two girls and um, he doesn't want a third daughter he want a boy and then this lady was pregnant and he was, she was worrying well, what happened if I have another another girl then uh, oh something's going to be bad my husband won't be happy so um, she came for uh, for shaking the oracle we call it shaking the bamboo stick we call it the oracle oracle and asked uh, what is inside is it a boy or a girl but before that he already have checked it out from ultra, ultrason, ultrasonic it was a, it, that the doctor said it was a girl and he has been crying for days and he wanted a confirmation whether the doctor was right that it was a girl. The doctor said it was a girl. So he came in and he shook the oracle and all that. And the bamboo sticks comes out. And I don't know what the number. And then he presents the number to, to, uh, to a poi or whoever in there. And then they find out the, the chip. And they read the English explanations. And it says, it's a boy. And, and then... And then the lady said, oh, then my, uh, I'm sure my doctor is right. How can my doctor be, be wrong and this oracle right? But he, she feels happy. And the final result is, there was a boy. So, so, so this oracle is even more exact in decision making than the, um, than the doctor's words. But why? When she was shaking the oracle in front of the Bodhisattva, the Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva, maybe she was so involved in it. He had so much devotion, sincerity. He wanted an answer. Maybe, maybe he wanted help. And maybe he make a promise. Make a, she make a vow. If I had this, I know that this is going to be a girl. But it, can there be any miracle that make it into a boy? If it is a boy. I will do a certain number of good deeds to repay the Bodhisattva. He's, 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 he's trying, to, he's trying to, uh, to talk the Bodhisattva into helping her to get a boy. And I don't know if it's a Bodhisattva or some other gods. There are a lot of gods, a lot of devas in, in the temple or in anywhere. And these devas, sometimes they, they listen to people and they like to fulfill people's wishes. And they are protecting Buddhism too. They're called Buddhism protectors. Now if they know that, if they grant your wish, you're going to go by the Buddha's teaching. In the future, you're going to be a good person. You're going to follow the righteous path. And just by changing it to a boy, maybe to the God, not the Buddha, not the Buddha Sattva, could be just a God. It's an easy matter. So he just changed it. Not the Buddha. Maybe the, the, the Buddha didn't even have to bother or the Buddha Sattva didn't even have to bother, it's just the gods. There's so many guardian angels, you know, so many devas, who are, help, who are around helping people when you're in trouble. We call them, in North America, we call them the guardian angels. In the Chinese language, we call them devas, or in the Indian language, devas. And they're helping people too. And they're also the evils, the devils. It works both ways. They're devils who are hurting people ghosts hurting people but if you're always chanting if you have the righteous mind if you're always chanting the mantra you're following the right path the day there will be more devas surrounding you and protecting you than devils so make sure that you chant every day 
you prostrate every day, you're building up your energy every day. Why is prostrating and chanting words would give you the energy? Well, that requires a lot of lecturing to tell you. Why? That requires a lot of time, and we're running out today. So I'm, I stop at this point. Okay.